uh, never became an emperor. And uh, he was a very, Marcus Tillis Cicero was a very controversial character, um, but he, he came up with notions about what, it, what Rome, what is, the, what, is, what is the notion of Rome? And, and as the Roman Empire grew, what does that concept mean? And so he spoke, he originally wrote about the cultivation of the soul of the empire. And he said, if you don't cultivate the soul of the empire, it will die. It doesn't matter how big your armies are. It doesn't matter how much wealth you have or how much power you yield. The cultivation of the soul of the empire came back to its principles, its values of what, what he kind of defined as Rome. And so his work on refining Latin and Rome is a foundation of our language, in fact, today. Um, and he was actually, eventually, uh, he was killed. They, they stuck a sword down through his throat into his heart because he became so powerful. The emperor, Julius Caesar, was threatened by him. But what Marcus Tiller Cicero talked about or wrote about is the cultivation of the soul of the empire as being the most important aspect of uh, power and growth and success. I looked at that and that cultivation is the word that culture comes from. So culture, when we use the word, it's not um, an abstract observation of artifacts. Um, culture means to cultivate. So we brought this into our, our business and we started to ask the question of, okay, so what does it mean to cultivate the soul of your organization? And when we asked clients this question, uh, it was kind of interesting because I was scared at first thinking clients are going to think this is crazy or is this, and of course, you know, religion is one of the things, you know, sex, money, and religion are things you don't talk about at work. But I assured them, I just want to know their, their notion. Do they believe the organization is an organism and a living system, or do they believe it's a machine? That's a simple question. And if we want to do work design, then we need to have that question answered. And the second question we need to be clear on is if it's a living system, does the organization, and so I asked my clients directly at the beginning of an, of an assignment, does this organization have a soul? or not. Discuss. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it isn't. I want your opinion. And it leads to a very rich conversation. It's surprisingly rich when you think people might go, oh, this is you know, very uh, soft or very weird. But people really, and, and the surprising thing I found was in traveling around the world, was the Americans love it the most. Because they're more, I think in a way, somehow I realized they're more religious than other cultures. That was, was just shocking to me in working with them for the first time. But nevertheless, this question of, you know, does the organization have a soul? And if it does have a soul, how do you define it? What is the soul of the organization? And that question typically leads to people really saying, you know what, our soul of the organization is our values. It's our, it's our credo. It's our morals. It's our ethics. It's, it's, it's what we bring personally and our relationships with each other. So that work um, led to then teaching executives, how do you cultivate uh, the, the organization and how do you separate design from structure? Because there's a lot of confusion of people using the notion of structure and design interchangeably. So you'll take a structure such as a requisite or a hierarchical structure, or you can take an agile structure or you can take a lean or a, a TPS structure or a Kanban structure, but that's an element of design. It's only one element. So for design, we need to combine the structure though, also with the systems, the processes, but also with the culture. Because what you're doing is like when you're cooking, you can't have just one ingredient and say, well, I'm making bread, so I have flour or I have yeast. You need to have all these ingredients to design and to create the meal. And so, as we started to teach executives, we realized the best way to teach um, uh, design, we started to use design thinking from Stanford, but moreover, the most important thing we found in teaching design was to get clients to examine the, cult the current uh, way that they cultivate the soul of the organization. What do they do to cultivate uh, value and uh, the, the design of the, of the organization. So we were doing this work and we did it um, for 20 years. Um, mostly, you know, we were brought in for, for example, somebody's introducing like a big mining company was bringing in SAP and they got stuck and they brought us in to help with the design processes to make the SAP system flourish because it was getting 
Um, so some, some people saw us as being change management people. Some people thought we were org designers, but essentially what we were doing is we're getting the executives to really um, cultivate their organizations. And the only way you can do that is having them uh, pay attention to what's going on with their people, and what's happening um, in um, the way that people think about work and, and how they share. So that's kind of our background. And what happened was we carried on doing this design work for 20 years. It was very successful. Um, and we got known to be the culture people, like right? because we're talking about cultivation of the soul and the culture is a cultivation. Um, so we then got this reputation of being experts in culture, even though that's not what we designed ourselves for. We were just saying, well, we're designers and we're teaching design. Um, the thing that really struck me was in 2017 um, the phone started ringing and what and it came from uh, a lot of clients we've had our media clients uh, particularly in the US in you know, New York and, and and the Bay and California area and while I was watching on TV all this stuff happening with me too I was just you know like everybody else shocked at all the revelations uh, some of my own clients were now phoning me saying we need you to come back and do this work with us and I just told them, no, uh, we don't do sexual harassment work. We're not experts in law. We don't do compliance. Um, we can't help you. That's not our business. So it's, um, and it, particularly in America, which is very legal, legitimate, there's a lot of, um, kind of, they love their lawyers. It's a very dangerous place to go if you're going to be doing that training. You really know, need to know what you're dealing with, with uh, a compliance uh, legislation. To our shock and horror, our clients came back and said, no we've already done the compliance training. We have been doing compliance training for 20 years. We have been running these sexual harassment training programs every year for 20 years. And now we've discovered um, that it wasn't working. And what they discovered was this, as, as we all now starting to generally around the world starting to realize, was this, um, this veil of silence that um, the most powerful men and typically, I think it was one exception. We had one case in New York where there was a woman, but mostly men. Um, the most powerful men uh, in the business, uh, and typically the ones who were creating the most money and creating the most wealth and running the biggest programs and running the biggest shows or being the biggest producers. It was the most powerful man in the business who was then um, sexually harassing the least powerful uh, young women. And in, um, in that um, they wouldn't harass their peers and they wouldn't harass um, other powerful women. They would only harass the least. And so this had been hidden under a veil. And what's interesting about the cultivation of the soul of the organization, this was not just the problem of a victim and a, and, um, a, um, a perpetrator of violence. Um, so this was more about also the fact that everybody else kind of knew what's going on and kept quiet. And they kept quiet because of um, social reasons, but mostly because of economic reasons, because if they spoke up, they would be putting their own economic uh, future at jeopardy. So as I started to examine, so we went in and said, okay, let's look at what's going on. And uh, what our client said is we don't want uh, this to be a compliance fix. We know that compliance training doesn't work. Everybody does this training, the training is useless. But in fact, um, a lot of the clients, what happened was the many of the women who had now risen to middle and senior management ranks were saying that training was part of the problem, that all the compliance training was doing was creating um, a compliance of people to say, hey, you've been through the training, so if you don't follow, if, if somebody harasses you and don't report it, then, hey, look, we gave you the training. So uh, a lot of people were realizing the training itself was serving the company, protecting them legally by saying, hey, we provided training, but it actually was creating uh, a more dangerous work environment where people now felt they couldn't speak up. So then the question became, how do we deal with this uh, as a culture change? And what we found was a lot of companies were out there doing culture training, running how to change culture, here's a culture model, and those culture models don't work because they're academic and they're all up here. They're all very logical. They're not down here and they don't deal with the whole human being. So what we said to our clients, as we always do, we said, okay, to understand this, we must go on a journey together. 
uh, one of the things in True North, we don't come in with, here's our bag of tricks, here's our model, apply it, rinse and repeat, and everything's solved. That works for a machine. That works for technology. It does not work with human beings because we are continuously changing and adapting and we're actually um, messy <laughs> creatures. So the only way to deal with this, we said, well, okay, if we want to do this work and you wanted to bring us in, then what we have to do is we have to go on a journey of discovery together. We have to examine what happened here and um, we have to get to the root of the, how um, this culture, how this cultivation occurred. And so in doing that, what we did was we um, started to get, teach um, the executives themselves to go and conduct interviews. Um, and these are very dangerous interviews because what we're asking them to do is to step into each other's environment to ask questions about um, one question, which is safety. And so we thought rather than get caught up with sexual harassment and sex and all this, which is always, you know, gets people scared, let's start with something that everybody can understand, which is the very notion of safety, that there are two types of safety in a work environment. There's safety, which is obviously physical safety, um, which is natural hazards, uh, which need to be taken care of so people are not hurt. But the other safety is psychological safety. Are people feeling safe to speak up? Are people feeling safe to challenge? Are people feeling safe to allow a conflict to occur or um, to challenge, to, to, um, to particularly to challenge people who are in authority? Because what um, this crisis was showing was people weren't feeling safe to speak up. Um, and so that, so we went out and asked them to go and examine uh, the roots of this and to and so the way you do that of course is they have to do something which actually executives are very bad at which we call noticing and so when somebody says how do you cultivate an organization how do you do it like what is it that the technique well the technique of cultivation um, of an organization is uh, both very simple in an idea, but very difficult to do. And what it consists of is um, noticing. So what we discovered is when we sent uh, senior executives out and we say to them, okay, you're going to do, th noticing consists of three things. Um, it consists, first of all, of you're going to um, um, step, uh, do something today to step outside your comfort zone. That's the first rule of noticing is you must step outside your comfort zone. You must go to a space where you do not know. So we have our knowledge uh, and our know-how. The first step of noticing is step outside your knowledge, step into an area where you don't know what's going on and you acknowledge your ignorance. That's very critical because everybody says, oh, I know everything, then they can't learn. The second thing in noticing is they have to is they have to go and listen to someone and really listen to them and ask them, can you tell me about your work? And just listen to them. And this is a part of it is it's like a coaching technique of listening to that person. And, and the idea is then the executive is now taking 15 minutes with this person. The person knows why the executive has come and the executive is not there to solve their problem. They're not there to uh, um, give them a credit or compliment. They're not there to criticize them. They're not there to solve anything. They're there list, literally to notice and listen to this person's thinking and find out where this person is coming from. And so that listening allows the executives to understand aspects of the business they never understood. But it also has a, a, a ripple effect of cultivating a different way of relating power. Because when a senior executive comes to the front line and spends 15 minutes talking, uh, or not sorry, talking, uh, listening and noticing what's going on with one person for 15 minutes, all of the supervisors, all of the hierarchy, all of the managers who are spending their time trying to protect their power are disrupted because now um, the executives learning things that maybe they don't know. And so this is rooted actually academically in uh, the notion of tacit and explicit knowledge. And so AI is really focused on explicit knowledge. AI is fantastic for taking explicit knowledge that exists and it's really fantastic because it allows for knowledge that is roaming around to be organized. But what AI does not do is deal with tacit knowledge. So tacit knowledge is the 
the opposite of explicit. So tacit knowledge is our inner knowledge, our intuition, our experiences, our memories. So when executives were asking these questions of how is it, what is you doing and how is your work and how do you feel and what's going on? They were starting to get through the explicit knowledge to the tacit knowledge of what's happening in their business. And that tacit knowledge is where the cultivation occurs because as you're surfacing that tacit knowledge, uh, what you're doing is you're getting, um, you're growing the knowledge base of the organization. And in fact, you know, that's what Six Sigma is. That is what Lean is. That's what uh, most problem solving techniques, TQM, um, they're basically getting people in groups and trying to get them to, to mine the tacit knowledge of those groups. The difference here was though with this approach is we were sending people into the environment. Um, and this going to the environment disrupted the power balance because the supervisors and managers were now nervous because the executives are not asking for a report or a PowerPoint or a presentation. They're basically out there learning of what's going on, which then created a ripple effect of the supervisors and managers realizing, hey, we better take, pay attention too, because if we don't know what's going on, we're going to be in trouble. So, so that second step, and the third step is then asking, um, so the first step is step outside your comfort zone, step um, on a daily basis for 15 minutes. Second step is to go notice, listen to people about their world, but listen to them so deeply that they can hear themselves, which in effect actually is this kind of, is, it's a coaching process. And the third step is you're to bring that knowledge back and share it with your peers and say, what will I do with this knowledge I've learned today? What is the implication of this for our work as an overall business? So this exercise sounds really simple. Um, it is actually simple technically. It's based on, um, I think back in Peter Drucker in the 60s and 50s talked about managing by walking around, but then it wasn't implemented effectively. People just walked around. They said managing by walking around is just walking around being visible. It isn't. It's about this noticing. And within the Toto way, they, you can uh, Google Genshi Genbutsu or Gemba, G-E-M-B-A. Gemba is, is short. And that's another root of this exercise where it comes from. So it isn't like it's never been done before. It's been done by all great leaders. All great leaders do this noticing. And in the Toto way, uh, this Genshi Genbutsu, uh, which is then short to Gemba, is the notion of noticing. And it actually is um, really the soul um, of the Toto way. It's the soul of the sep what separates lean from the way. And so that, that's kind of really the way that we um, set about applying uh, the exercise of, of unpacking what's going on, of understanding the culture, of, of cultivating and creating the new culture to cultivate the future. And because by taking that action, then people were changing the, the relationships um, that were going on. Um, now, having done that, the question then became, um, so now we've got this opening of conversation. Uh, what do we actually need to do in terms of making changes? Because we've learned, we've got an appreciation. And this led to um, some hard questions about power. Um, in fact, the questions came back to three things. As we're examining what we were listening to, and what we were hearing, what we're hearing is number one, is that um, power was being abused. And so we needed to say, okay, so in order to get to the root of that, we've got to understand the use and abuse of power. But the second thing that came up that was very evident was in this triangle, the, the, it was money. Money, the culture of money was driving this unsafe environment, this um, hostile environment. And so to ignore money, to say we're not gonna talk about money would be foolish because it was clearly people were keeping quiet because they were scared of losing income, of losing their reputation, losing their jobs, their careers. Uh, the young women who were being harassed and uh, attacked uh, were stuck because their future would be destroyed. And the person who's making the most money, the person who's creating, who's the, uh, the, the biggest show producer or the biggest um, 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 CEO or executive, the one who's created the most money is the one who's doing the abuse. So we said, we need to understand the culture of money. And the third thing we need to do, and this was very difficult, <laughs> is we've got to get the word sex on the table. We can't keep skirting around it and avoiding, if we're going to talk about the cultivation of a, 
of a human system and organizations are an organism but it's a human system a living human system then our sexuality is part of that and if we avoid it then we're avoiding the conversation and these things will happen again so i'll take you through all three of those because uh, they all then triangulate together and they connect first in terms of power what we realized was that in the use of power there are basically uh, if you really break it down to a very simple element like occam's razor you break it to the right to its finest point uh, whether you've got a hierarchical environment or an agile environment or a lean environment whatever the environment you create power um, exists in two forms the first form power exists in um, what is in is entitled power entitled power like the word suggests entitled a title is given to someone so you get your power from your title you get your power from your position from your role so i'm an agile coach i'm a scrum master i am an executive uh, but it's also true in other institutions i am the priest or i am the mother or i'm the grandmother or i'm the father or the older brother um, and so in society in life both at work and out of work power comes from your title and people some people use that power in different ways so we have to acknowledge that that's entitlement so you're given title and then some people get stuck in that title and we call that entitlement that's why we call it entitlement somebody's stuck in the title um, and in fact we joke about entitlement that they don't know what they what, the, what is meant by the title is where people are stuck so when we discovered that people who uh, are if you start to notice that noticing uh, people who are stuck their power comes from their title and their position then you've got some danger sign you've got a red flag because they're using the authority given to them in their position as i say this applies not only to business but it applies to all our families and so you could be the older sister you could be the grandmother you could be the father um, and <clears throat> and you can use that position that title to draw power so that's the one aspect of power so we started to ask let's examine the relationship people have with the power that they're given through their position the second aspect of power is our human power our natural um, intuition our passion our compassion our intellect uh, all of this power the energy that we bring as a human being so people are coming in with that power too now where these two are aligned and this is what I think the agile shift is so vital and what's happening with agility today is it's finally bringing uh, more clarity for people's power is being brought to their positions whereas in hierarchical, hierarchical traditional organizations uh, people have, re have relied on position power over personal power so when it comes now to the question of what is my power the shocking thing that we discovered was that there is no Correlate, direct correlation between organizational power and personal power. In other words, we have situations where people have very high level, if somebody is very much dependent on their title, then the, there is an inverse relationship to how much personal power they're using. So for example, think back now all of you to uh, great um, leaders you've known people in your families and your loved ones in your in your private life but also in organizations people who've really influenced you people who've really inspired you people think about that for a minute think about somebody who you know really made you took you to another level and what you'll generally find is that person may have had a big title in the family or a big title in the organization but their own personal power was higher they, in other words, they didn't need to really use the club. They didn't have to use the stick of their institutional or title power because they use their personal power. And that's the definition of leadership. Leadership comes from that internal uh, exercise of power. So we started to notice this pattern and we said that's measurable, that people will notice this. We know people who use their title to bully others. And we know people who use their natural human connection um, and empathy and relationships to influence people. We know that, we see it. And we have, and of course, we have good and bad days, <laughs> so we're human, but you can start to see a pattern. So what we discovered in terms of creating safety, a psychological safety in the, in the environment, we have to start flagging within ourselves 
firstly, and then with each other, people who are using title power versus over their own personal human power. The other thing that we discovered was those, and this was actually interesting because I was getting deep into this, um, I, I came across a fascinating piece of research that was being done simultaneously at Oxford University and at Harvard. And it's a 20 year study. And what this 20 year study showed was those executives and those people, and it doesn't have to be executives, it could be a supervisor, it could be a head of a family, a mother or a father or an older cousin or whoever, but anybody who relies overly on their title, the day that title disappears, they have uh, a 60% uh, increased probability of having a breakdown. In other words, what we discovered through that study uh, over 20 years was that those executives who were relying heavily on their position and title power suddenly retired, got fired, or, or maybe left for whatever reason. Once that title is taken away, they actually have a breakdown. They have, uh, in the first two years of retirement, those people who are relying on entitlement and have that attitude uh, have a stroke have a heart attack, uh, have depression, or even have, in, in some cases, suicide. Um, but there's really a, a large case of when, if you, so in other words, if you over rely on that title, when that title is gone, you will get depression. You will fall down into the darkness. And so that can happen to a parent who is bullying children, and suddenly now the children have grown up and their title no longer has value and they can't use that bullying, or it can happen at work. So we started to share this research to say, we need to understand the nature of power, because if we don't understand it, it hurts us, not just now, but in the future. So, and then noticing that, we noticed that none, zero, like zero of the psychological assessments that were being conducted, and zero of the culture surveys actually asked these questions. In fact, what we discovered, in fact, it was one of my clients, uh, one of the senior executives, she, when she, she stood up and she said, do you know what, what's happened here? She said, the psychological assessments we're using, the personality assessments, the uh, assessments of, of, of uh, hiring and promoting have actually concealed the problem. And so what we discovered is we said, well, let's, let's examine this. So what we did is we went back to all of the um, men and one woman, as I say, but all the men who had conducted sexual violence, who had been bullies, and who had been corrupting uh, innocence, we said, can we go back and get some data on the last seven years of psychological personality and coaching assessments of this individual? Because surely, in their, you know, these these executives have had so many assessments. They have personality assessments. They have performance reviews. They have succession planning reviews. You know, so all of these coaching, coaching, coaches coming and giving them uh, assessments and development. Surely over a seven year period, if we go back, we should see, see clues of the scene of the crime. What we discovered was there were some inklings. You could see little patterns. But what happened overall out of those studies was it actually they normalized those executives. So in other words, if I'm a, a brutal bully and I'm using my position power to beat down people and get them to do things my way, and I get an assessment every year that actually promotes me, what those assessments are doing is that they are normalizing um, violent behavior. They, they're normalizing the behavior of these people. They're telling the rest of the organization, hey, if you want to succeed, be like him because he's passed and he's been promoted. And those assessments are not getting at the, the nature of power. They're not getting at this question. So that was the first thing that we started to, and then of course, um, to address that, the only way to address that is to go back to Gemba or Genshikambutsu or managing by walking around MBWA or what we call noticing. The only way to cut the trip, the wire of these assessments and relying on the 360s and relying on these personality reviews and performance reviews was to say, we have to just pay attention to our own um, understanding, our own presence of what's really going on. And we need to make that conversation happen. So then what we discovered was having that conversation um, about power is something that is essential. But the other question we came back to was money. So then we start asking the question of what is the culture of money? 
And what's interesting about that is that every one of us on this call and everyone in the world has a unique relationship with money. And what we started to notice in, the, in our work was that if you start understanding somebody's relationship to money, you pretty much understand them as a human being. And so this sounds crazy, but think about your own relationship for a minute, your relationship with money. And think about people around you, what their relationship with money is. And what you, if you actually pay attention, if you notice it, what you'll notice is um, they, that expresses both uh, your values, but also how you feel about yourself and how you feel about life. In other words, what we discovered was when we examine the culture of money, the relationship people have with money, it gave us a better indication of that person's personality and values than any values or culture or personality assessment. So for example, some people, and this actually, I did this in a conference of CFOs. It was really interesting. So I had 200 CFOs in the room and I asked them to do this exercise. And I said, um, so I want, you know, you guys are the heads of finance but I want you to take a minute to put aside your title and your role. And I want you to examine your personal relationship with money in your life, in your home. So for example, some people have a coercive relationship with money. So in other words, money is something that they uh, obsess over. They're, they're scared of losing. They want more of it. The more money they can have, the more they feel comfortable in psychologically. So having more money means having more psychological safety and so that's a very coercive relationship it's a uh, of relationship money some people have a collusive relationship with money where money becomes like something you can have fun with like so so for example that's why we do gambling uh, we put money in we see can we win it becomes a game um, and that's where we get um, the whole notion of um, uh, you know money is actually something to have fun with it's also true for when people do investing. You see it there, you know, the, the uh, dopamine um, uh, chemicals rise when somebody wins a bet, uh, or they also happens why people get obsessed and almost addicted to this collusive relationship with money when they're doing investments. So they can make all the money in the world, but they can't stop because they want to keep investing uh, for the same reason that gamblers do. So the investment, the whole investment thing is a, is a collusive relationship with money where money is, and, and then you have a coactive relationship with money. A coactive relationship with money is where money is an energy. Money is a form of energy that we're using to meet an end. So I asked these CFOs, be, no, I'm not asking you to share publicly, privately, personally. I want you to think about what is the relationship of money in your personal life? Is it coactive? In other words, is it means to an end in a productive way? Is it a form of energy we're using to create things? Is it collusive? It's kind of fun to win the game? Or is it co co coercive in the sense that it's, it's um, something that defines me as a person in my life? It is consuming me. And so I got them to do that individually and um, asked them to think about, you know, and then basically, um, you know, a lot of the people there felt that they wouldn't do, uh, you know, the right thing to do is to have a coactive relationship with money. But then we asked the question of the CFOs, um, so that's you personally, that's how you relate to money. Um, how about other people in your family? So we actually got them to think about that. And then there was a great conversation with, oh yeah, my wife's like this, my husband's like this, or my mother was like this. So they have a really, they have a very rich conversation about the people in their lives in terms of the relationship to money. And you start to see a very rich relationship conversation about people's, uh, who they are, their personas, their personality. And in fact, the word persona means mask. So personality means essentially mask. But we're getting behind the mask, behind the personality to the person's raw, naked self. And so that was the conversation around money. We then asked the CFOs, okay, so now talk about what is the culture of money in your business? Is it coercive? You know, or is it collusive or is it coactive? And the notion again is that if you have, uh, and this is really interesting as we found with a lot of our clients were startups, a lot of startups start with a very coactive relationship with money. It's everybody together trying to win um, and trying to make a mean and end because the, the, the mission, the goal is bigger. Um, and then suddenly those companies as they grow start to having a collusive uh, uh, relationship with money and eventually a coercive. So you actually start to see a pattern 
And when a company has a coercive relationship with money, then that's when you start up to make them more vulnerable. So, so those are the applications of um, the culture of money. And then what we, what we started to show was if somebody has a coercive relationship with money and they are very caught up in their title, they're more likely to be the ones who are going to commit future crimes. In other words, we've dealt with how we recover from um, hostility in the work environment and sexual harassment. But now we must discover, discuss how do we avoid it in the future? So these were then now two things we're looking at, two factors. So, um, so, yep. so yep. we have a question from Fabio to you. Oh, Fabio. Yeah, Fabio, go ahead. Yeah, hi. 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 Uh, so my question would be, uh, you were talking about relationship with money. Uh, is there any way to assess that? I mean, is there any uh, questionnaire which is available to assess that? First of all, yeah. quite interesting too. And the second mm -hmm. thing is, uh, you were talking about uh, having a conversation about which is the relationship with money within your family. Do you think that's also driven by your country you're coming from? Um, very much so, yeah. yeah. So on the questionnaire, I can send you, we have a very basic questionnaire which consists of three questions which I can send back out to everybody, uh, which really is what I've just mentioned, the model of collusive, coercive, and, and um, coactive. Um, so I can send a write-up on that. Uh, the actual fact is there is actually every individual has a unique relationship with money. But because we couldn't create a system that was, you know, that would, that would be too complex. So what we did is we created the model uh, which allowed for people to at least start examining in themselves. So the way that we do it is we start number one in the assessment is we ask somebody to assess their own. We take them back to their private life. So we say, okay, I want you to examine your relationship with money in your private life. Secondly, I want you to examine it with the people that you've known. And that gets people using the model in a safe environment where they're, you know, then we get them to apply that model in their business. So that's, that's the method that we use. It's more of a methodology, but I can send you the, the questions we use for that um, and how okay. that can be applied. And the second question you raised is really, really interesting um, because that's why we call it the culture of money because uh, you're absolutely right across countries, across cultures, um, but also right down even within a culture, you have um, immigrants have a different view of money than say people who are second, third, fourth generation. Uh, women have a different view of money than men in, in, in a relationship. Um, so, but what that's interesting about it is um, there are cultural differences, um, but the, ultimately, even within a family unit, maybe like two or three children, two daughters and a son and a parents and grandparents, everybody's relationship for money will be different. And a lot of conflicts that happen in families uh, and, in, and in love relationships occur because they, we don't examine this question of the culture of money. And because we don't discuss it, it, it then um, that's the source, it becomes other problems. Other, you know, other issues, people start bickering over other things. So it's generally speaking, in terms of your second question, um, absolutely there's a tie to culture. But as I said at the beginning uh, of the webinar is that this is bleeding edge. We don't have the answers to all of this. We're starting to ask these questions because we're trying to get beyond just the traditional, get a survey, fill it out, and we've got a pattern. Oh, that's the pattern. Because we think that's a very mechanical way of identifying what a human living system is. The more powerful way is how do you create rich dialogue? How do you create this question first within yourself, then within a safe environment, and then within your business? And it's just like, um, I mean, same thing as in Agile, when we have um, a retrospective, or when we have a sprint review or a plan, um, when we have a scrum meeting. Um, what Agile has done is created these conversations. And so what we're doing in this is trying to we're kind of getting away actually from surveys being the answer to saying no we've got to create um we've got to educate people and create opportunities for people to have these conversations with each other which allows them to cultivate allows them to create uh the future does that answer your question yeah yeah thank you okay sure so so we've actually now covered two aspects of the three so we've got the question of the um the use and abuse of power um, and how uh, position title versus your own power, you can start to measure that. Secondly, we've got this issue around the, cult the 
culture of money, which now leads us to the third aspect, which is the kind of the dangerous one <laughs> that everybody sees, which is how do we now actually have the conversation about our human sexuality in a work environment where we haven't been allowed to, which is part of the reason why all this Me Too stuff happened, because senior executives realize, people in power realize, hey, nobody's going to talk about sex, so it's safe. And in fact, what we discovered was some of these executives became sex addicts because they weren't addicted to the sex, they were addicted to the power, to the dopamine, the hit they were getting because they were getting away with more and more to the point where it wasn't even, it was like an addiction. They were just enjoying, it wasn't to be sexual addiction, it was more a power addiction because as uh, most of the feminists, we looked at the last 20 years of feminist literature, it tells you straight away that rape is not a sex crime, it's a crime of power. It's about power, uh, having power over someone. And so when you looked at that relationship between sex and power, what we start to realize is that these uh, executives were using the fact that you, because humans could not have this conversation about sexuality, they had a, and because they have power over others, um, and because they have control over money, we are now allowing this silence to occur. And, we're, and the safety of the environment is, you know, psychological safety is broken. People are not feeling safe to speak up. So we said we have to deal with this. And uh, actually, some of our clients said no. They said, we don't want to do this. We said, fine, it's your, your organization, it's your future. And at least half of our clients said, OK, we're, that's where we're drawing the line. We're not going to go there. Um, but I, I was working actually with, um, uh, actually, I should actually mention just quickly, a number of people who've helped me with this. And Nick Kettles from CTI, from Suzanne Reber, who's a journalist, uh, a great journalist. Uh, Megwin White in New York and Anita Teresa. These uh, are people who've really actually started to think more openly about culture in these ways. But what we started to ask, uh, uh, and we're working on currently actually, um, is the whole question of our sexuality and how do you have that conversation in, with yourself and with uh, people you're working with. <clears throat> and and the, the, the blockage is that. Um, sex has been reduced we've lost the meaning of what is sexuality so we have to just like culture we have to go to the root or just like money and power we have to get to the root of what does this really mean so the way that sexuality has been defined has been reduced into um, an act and into an event um, and the event occurs between two private people in a room and that's sexuality but that's not really our sexuality our sexuality is an energy it is our creation life force so if we think about sexuality not as an act, private act between two people over a certain period of time, and so our sexuality is actually our energy. It is the energy that creates life. And we start thinking in terms of, uh, of the creation life force. Let's think about that. The creation life force that has created all of us, that creates all of nature, is what sexuality is. It is our creation life force. And so what we started to see was um, the question of if somebody has um, a positive relationship with their own sexuality as a form of energy. Um, in in um, ancient China, they talked about, and, uh, they talked about uh, qi, the qi energy, which is our whole vital life force. Uh, in the Japanese ancient culture, they talked about qi. Uh, and this, of course, was the basis for uh, health and well-being uh, and acupuncture and our meridians. And in the Indian ancient culture, they talked about uh, prana, pranic energy and the five pranic life forces. So prana is, the, they're all the same thing. These, all of these ancient uh, wisdoms talked about that we have this life force within us. When that life force gets stuck, and you know, there's all kinds of reiki and chakras, which I'm not gonna get into, but whatever the philosophy you have, if your life force, that energy flow is stuck, you're ill. And what we discovered was that for a lot of these senior executives, as we started to talk to the psychologists and people who were helping them and people examining them and getting interviews with them, is their life force was stuck. They had money, they had power, but they had no fulfillment. And so they were using sexual crimes, rape and uh, sexual harassment in order to fill that gap inside of them. So this sexual energy, understanding our sexual energy, understanding our, our life force is critical for our, our mental well-being and our emotional well-being. And that needs education. That needs people to be educated and first of all, have to understand themselves. But then also noticing in their environment, 
Now, how do you turn that energy into a creative energy for innovation? Because if you think about this, and we've all examined this, we've all worked in teams where everybody's worked together um, and the energy comes together and we create something new. Now, we don't use the word sexuality for that because we think of it as a separate event between two people, but it actually is our sensual energy, our passion, our commitment that has come together. And so we, what we discovered was now this triangle of these three things. What we discovered was that um, if those three things, money, power, and sex, are reduced and dehumanized into an event or a product or an act, what happens is um, we get trauma. We get exploitation. That's what will happen. And so in order to uh, shift that culture, we have to find an alternative to that. And the alternative is noticing the energy, noticing the energy of power. Power is an energy. The power we have in ourselves is an energy force. And um, the money, money is a form of energy. That's all it is. Money is a form of energy. It's a way that we've socially agreed to determine priorities and determine exchange and determine trade. And so it allows for the energy flow in society. So if we think of money, and in fact, uh, what I discovered was money, the word currency, when we think about currency, so currency means a current, like a river. So the currency is the flow of money. When the flow of money slows down in an economy, we know what happens. You get a recession. And if it really slows down, the currency, the current flow of money is really slowed down, it gets into a depression when it gets stuck. So what we discovered was that flow, that currency of money, also applies to the currency of power. If the power of, a, of an individual and leaders is flowing, if it's connecting, if it's not just using and abusing and using titles, if it's flowing, this strong currency, um, when it's getting stuck, you, get, you literally get organizational recession and organizational depression. And then we sound the same thing with sexuality, is that when the sexuality is flowing, when, it's, um, when you're breathing and it's going through natural flow, then you get, you, get, you get very energized, do life. But when it's stuck, what it does, it's dep it creates depression. It creates recession. So we came back to this notion of currency as the measure. So again, these measures begin with uh, asking yourself from within, what is my currency? What is my flow in those three areas? What's, and then this is the most important exercise. And, and in fact, I want, I want all of you guys, if you take away anything from this uh, discussion, um, I want you to take away this exercise um, for yourselves. Because the only way to do this, you know, you can do surveys, you can do instruments, but that this is not a mechanical industrial model. We're doing human beings. The first thing you've got to do is ask those three questions of yourself. What is the currency? What is the flow of my power? That's the first question. And in my personal relationships at home, and in my roles that I play, because we all play multiple roles, right? So I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm a um, son, I'm a you know, neighbor, I'm a citizen. So in all my roles, am I using my title to have power over other people? Or am I using my power with, my personal power with other people? Um, and so that's the first set of questions we have to ask ourselves. Is how, what is the currency flow? If I'm using my power with people, then there's a flow. This, the energy grows. When I'm using my power over people by using my positional title, be it work or at home, then I create depression recession. I create, I create um, um, contraction because and trauma. The same is true for my relationship to money. So if I have an open, coactive relationship with money and I'm understanding its flows, where it's coming in, where it's going out, I understand the balances, it's actually creating energy. But if I get obsessed with money, or if I get afraid of, and some people are afraid of them, can you believe this? People are afraid of money, but people don't want to talk about money. They're actually afraid of it. They're afraid to ask for the right price when they're selling themselves. They're afraid to bill properly. They're afraid to even examine the financial aspects of Agile or the business they're in. They won't look at the budgets and the money. So there's fear of money. So if, it's, if I have that relationship with money, then uh, 
that's a form of recession in me, depression in me. And the third, of course, um, needless to say, the flow of sexuality versus uh, when it's stuck and it's not flowing, where, which also causes depression and recession. So that's the first set of questions we all must start asking ourselves. Because if we don't, if we start there, this is the instrument. Um, in tantric uh, sexuality, in tantric, in ancient tantra, they were uh, they asked, what is the best measurement instrument um, for, your, for your life? And that is your body, your, your own self, your intuition. This, this thing here is the best instrument for assessment in the world. So that's the first step, is to examine that in yourself. When you examine those three things in your own life, it will give you the tools and ability to hold the conversations with others. And when you start holding these conversations with others, then you start opening up the energy of the organization. Then you start opening up the culture of the organization. Then you start opening up the innovation in the organization. But you can't take a shortcut and say, well, here's the four step process. Let's put him in a room. And you, I mean, you create a glass cage and you can create, a, you can fake it for a while, you know, just get everybody facilitated to make that energy come up. But it's gonna go away, it's just dependent on the facilitator in that space. If you want natural energy, you've got to do this work yourself. Now, what we did is we built it into our coaching and we never wanted to be coaches. We thought the coaching industry is, is, is actually, you know, there's another conversation for another day. I think the coaching industry is bankrupt and I see it's devious and I think is causing more harm than good. But in that, so but we, we got dragged into it ourselves. So we do this coaching with executives. As part of the executive coaching, we, we cover this with them to teach them to get in touch with their energy. Um, so that's the first question I'd like you to think about as you go forward in terms of yourselves. The second thing, if you're brave enough, is ask those three questions of your loved ones. So start at home first. Ask yourself in terms of the, uh, the culture of, of power, how power is used and abused in your family and your loved ones, and which of your relatives are abusive of power, and which ones aren't, and where are you in relationship to your family? and your loved ones, when do you end up using the title versus using the flow? And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very tough one, but it is actually one that really starts to educate us. Um, and actually uh, what we discovered in our coaching was that when I've sent senior executives go do this with their families, they'll come back and actually be in tears because they'll say, I've never realized that I didn't have a proper relationship with my mother my whole life. I've, I've been projecting on her and I've, and we've been missing each other and we've never, I've never really noticed her. I never actually paid attention to um, where she's coming from, what's, what's blocking her, that she's maybe not, that she's, in, she's suffering. Um, I just judged her. And that's been really, that's kind of was wild because we're not psychologists and we, as I say, my background's in design. So this was kind of unusual, but it was, uh, so that's the second thing I'd like you to think about. Um, if you genuinely want to understand culture, the culture starts with a cultivation of your own life. Um, the third one then is then I think you're ready to take it into business because once you've got that under your belt, you can start having those conversations and you will start noticing these things in work. Now, some of you may say, you know what, I just want to notice it, that's great. But if you're really interested, then you, know, you can actually start practicing it. You can start to create these conversations but you can't do it until you've gone through the journey yourself first. So, questions for anyone? Awesome, my Any friend. Questions? Impressive. Now I'm completely depressed. <laughs> so we'll start drinking by tonight. By now. <laughs> but uh, I disagree. In Western Europe, and in, in most of the country I lived in, is we have a standards about emotions. We never talk even about sex or about money. You, right. <laughs> not possible. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, great point. Actually, yeah. And actually, even on the, I mean, sex is one thing, but even on the money front, it's really interesting when we start to, um, I've actually, you know, because I've been working with these executives all my working life. And so I'll go to um, each of them. Some of them don't even know anything beyond their own budgets. So you start thinking, so let's talk about the P&L and the cash flow and the balance sheet. And let's talk about, um, the future investments. And a lot of them, the market is only concerned about how do I hit my number? And the operations people are only obsessed with how do I hit my number? And the problem is that when you become an executive, the word executive is really interesting. It has two meanings. 
uh, and, it's, and you know, we use this word all the time, executive, executive, but it actually has two meanings that are very important. The first meaning of executive is to execute, to do things, to make things happen. But what executives do is they take the future and they make it happen now. They do things, they make sure that the business is taking action. But the other word to ex executive comes from the word to ex execute, which means to, to kill, to stop, to say no. So what executives do is they decide what to say no to, what to stop, what to execute, what to kill, and what to execute in terms of what to actually do. And so when we're doing that, um, when you become a member of the executive team, of the top team, what happens is your job is no longer just to run marketing or run operations or run finance um, or run the supply chain. Your job is to execute to determine for the overall organism for the overall business what it needs to stop doing what it needs to start doing what action does it need to take and that's the role of an executive and what was interesting is when i started to see how people were trying to scale um various you know whether scrum or agile they completely blind to this what they'll do is they'll take scrum or they'll take the techniques or the manifesto from from agile and they'll use safe or less or various other uh, techniques to try to scale those techniques. But what they're not doing is getting those executives to understand, well, what is, how does that change the way executive designs their business? How does that help them understand their culture? It's that's, a complete blind spot. That's very fascinating. The point is, uh, yeah, scaling is the wrong way. Is, is just here is we, we're giving faster horses to the market. It's not the way we arrange things, but that's not a debate. But mm -hmm. what you're talking about is very interesting is the relationship of leaders in complex LRP systems. We call it a uh, constructive irritants. Mm -hmm. So we have the double meaning of executive here. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, it's actually, it's just quite interesting. I've never heard that before, but that's, that is very interesting, yeah. Yeah. Any question in the audience? And you can click on the gallery view of Kashmir. These are all the leftovers. Mm -hmm. If you have no question in the audience, I do have a couple of questions. Oh, Oscar, are you able to talk? Hello. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, very clear. Okay. Uh, my question is, um, well, you give us three questions to ask ourselves. Um, my question is the next one. Once I uh, recognize which is the answer for each of one, how do I get improvement? Or it's just about to know yourself, uh, to acknowledge how do you feel about those three emotions? I don't know if I'm clear. No, no, it's a good question. So, so do you mind, can I do an experiment with you right now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, because what, what these questions I've asked are actually, uh, are you familiar with the notion of action learning? Um, I, am, I am a lean leader, so I know about uh, Toyota. Yeah, okay. Uh, but, so, one, so one of the concepts is action learning. So what we have is we have, two types of assessment. We have assessments that are linear, that are um, what we call summative. A summative assessment is, um, I will ask you a question and you'll give me an answer and I will find a pattern. And then I take the pattern and then I just use that pattern to determine what action I should take and I will implement the action. That's a summative problem solving approach. That works with machines beautifully. It works with computers, it works with, um, um, building, constructing tower blocks. So summative assessment is where I ask you a question, you have to answer it, we find a pattern and we use the pattern to implement. What we're talking about here though is action learning, which is a developmental assessment. In other words, when I ask you the question, it actually changes you. Okay. So in other words, <laughs> the, but, but when I ask you the question, so, so you don't have to answer this question. Actually, I'm, I'm going to ask you actually out of, out of, um, um, out of um, politeness and out of uh, um, respecting your, your, um, your, your, um, your confidentiality and your uh, privacy. 
out of privacy, I'm not going to ask you not to answer these questions, but I want you to think about this for a minute. And so, for example, you have, um, uh, are you married? No. No. Uh, do you have a wife? Or do, you have a, do, you have a, do you have a mother? A mother alive? Uh, um, you mean my mother? Yeah, I have a mother, yes. Yeah, okay. So don't answer this question. Okay. <laughs> so I want you to, to, to examine, this is, this is learn, uh, action learning, to examine those three questions, that, and especially the sex one is very difficult, I know, <laughs> especially with mothers. <laughs> but that's where we came from, right? That's how we arrived here. Yes, but okay. um, think about um, how your mother uses power, whether, it's, um, whether she's using power over people or with people and um, what that does to quality of her life. So it's just an examination, right? So, um, and then the second question is in terms of uh, money, what is her relationship with money? Is it coercive? Is it, coll is it collusive? Or is she very coactive? What is her relationship with money? And then um, let's leave sex for time being, because that doesn't with mothers, that's kind of weird. <laughs> but it works. <laughs> that's leave that to your wife and your and lovers and other people in your life. But um, so, so at least for those two. Um, so first question then is to start examining that. The second step is then to go have that conversation with her. And what will happen in a, to cultivate the culture, you know, to cultivate uh, relationships, in that conversation, everything will change. By having the conversation, um, the very nature of your relationship with her and your relationship with yourself will change. So the change, is, that's what we call action learning. It isn't we go do this assessment and now I have to go implement it. It is, and this is what exec has found with this notion of Gemba or Genshik and Butsu or managing by walking around or what I call noticing, is once you get executives doing this, paying attention, um, they're all of the money that they spend on culture surveys, on assessment surveys, on team assessments is rubbish. It's rubbish. All they're getting is um, abstractions of reality. When people fill out a survey about their team, you get these results and go, oh, we found something. Well, people already knew, but now we're dependent on the assessment. So what, so what I'm kind of, we're doing is a different way of cultivating an organization. It's a different way of, of managing the culture. And what it consists of is noticing and having um, really candid, um, um, what we call um, uh, open conversations, but really it's actually uh, genuine or authentic conversations. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the word authentic conversation is interesting because um, our authority comes from two places. So what's interesting, the word authority the word authority comes from what is authored. So authority is, the, the source of the word authority is who is authoring the, the, the narrative of your family and of your, of your business. And so the authority can be the title, it could be the hierarchy, it's gonna come from the top, they are the authors. The authority, that's an authoritarian organization. The alternative is author, authoring also is the basis for authenticity. Our authenticity comes from our authoring. And that's where I think Agile and Lean and Six Sigma and, and the future of these organizations is coming, is the authentic, having authentic conversations creates a different type of culture. So we can have authentic conversations or we can have authoritarian conversations. Authoritarian conversations is let me figure you out, let me tell you what your marking assessment is, will you pass or fail, that's authoritarian. But with our mothers, <laughs> with our family, having an authoritarian conversation doesn't work. So having an authentic conversation about power, about money, and in some relationships about sex, having authentic conversations creates power, creates uh, energy. So, so that's the difference. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, 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 yes yeah. It's, it's a very different way than we've been taught um, from traditionally thinking about culture, um, and change management. Yeah, you're completely right. This was a part of a game. Thank you. The emperor, oh, thank you. Uh, emperor's new clothes. You know this this uh, small story. Is if you're feeling naked, you get you have more power than the other with the clothes. Is meaning I'm authentic. So I'm, I'm in fact, being authentic, uh, raise up your power. Yeah, and then that's what's interesting. I find in with the 
agile is when you have a hierarchical culture and people are trying to implement agile or agile agility, it, um, it doesn't work because for agility to work, you've got to have a, um, a culture that is based on um, authentic conversations. And so I noticed that whenever I travel and I'm looking at the most powerful, effective teams, People are looking at, you know, uh, should we use the Spotify model? Should we use the Scrum model? Should we use the less model? Should we use the safe model? That doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Pick anyone. But the truth is, in, an, in, an, in a business environment of requisite agility, where the agility is really alive, people are having authentic conversations. They're having lots of conflicts. And you can pick it up straight away. And you don't need a survey to pick that up. You start to examine it. But where people are having authoritarian, and this is another actually interesting question around where people are trying to scale agility. And they're saying, well, we've got it in this environment. We have great success because we're having authentic conversations, the iterations and our, uh, our planning meetings, our sprints, our retrospectives are really getting issues out on the table. People are having open conversation. So authentic conversations increase. But then they're saying, okay, can we take this to the executive and other areas? Well, you can only scale it by changing the cultivation of the energy in other areas. And that's where I think a lot of people are, um, are fooling themselves. They think they can, only, they can just scale the techniques of Agile and therefore change the culture of the company. They can't. They've got to do, uh, they have to have those authentic conversations. I, I have another question for a very a, a stupid guy. It's called Amit. <laughs> <laughs> He's That's a lovely friend. man, lovely man. <laughs> <laughs> he asked, uh, I prefer uh, telling the question because I know Amit's connections, uh, connectivities. So how important you think is the ability to examine situations through different cultural lenses? See, this again is part of the challenge. So we have these notions of culture because we have, uh, we look at the artifacts and lang of language of symbols, rituals, of, um, and particularly language is the mother of culture, right? So it's, but the, the, when you actually start to examine true culture, the cultivation, there is a human cultivation that, that actually cuts beyond any social culture. In other words, and I, and I noticed actually, particularly uh, living in Canada and working in the States, Canada's a very, particularly the Toronto area is very, uh, it's almost like a microcosm of the world. You literally see it in every bus queue and every shop and every business. Um, we have literally every culture in the world here. So I think we sometimes get caught up in um, the, cult the social um, or religious or uh, community culture. But there's another form of those. I, th I, I think of those as subcultures. Those are subs. So an Indian culture, let's, let's take an example, the Indian culture there are subcultures within that, the Punjabi, Gujarati, Bengali culture, completely different. When you get to Maharati, completely different. When you get to the Maharati working in Bangalore and Pune and, and Mumbai, there are cultures of those cities is different. So when you start getting into the looking at culture, the, we're asking the wrong question uh, of saying, uh, what is the culture? And what is even the cultural lens? And so asking the question of, um, cultural lenses is actually is actually dangerous because what they say is this is a cultural lens is something fixed i can identify and define what we, the, the the more powerful question or the useful question is how do you cultivate the soul of this institution if this institution is a family if this institution is a religion if this religious institution is a business or a government whatever that institution is if we ask the question because that question is define us and if we ask the questions, what's the lens and what's the definition, we're coming to a dead end. But if we ask instead, the question is, how do I cultivate the soul of this institution? That moves us, the only way to do that is to move to authentic conversations. The only way to do that is to understand ourselves and then through that lens, understand others. And that takes us then into uh, a cultivation that is cutting across all of humanity. And I've been very, very blessed to work around the world in all five continents across different industries. So whether it's in Australia or South Africa or Bolivia or in Colombia or whether it's in, in Germany, you know, no uh, or India, 
or the UK, once you get past a certain level of socialized culture, once you get past that, you find a humanity that connects us all. And, and, when, and this question from Marcus Tiller Cicero from 2000 years ago, of how do you cultivate the soul of an institution? Is, is, is that, that is uh, the most, that's how we move to humane institutions, humane organizations. But if we don't ask that question, if we treat culture as a survey or a lens or an answer that's got a calculation, then we're dead. Then we, then we, then we can't move forward. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely, I discovered the same thing we try, uh, working all around the globe is how similar we all are. Yes, as human beings, yeah. Yeah. You know what, you see, you, see, you see the Olympic Games when people, when athletes have come from all these different cultures, when they're winning or losing, the emotions are human. You know, you see it at a funeral. You see it actually, there's a famous story, you know, seeing people at airports, all airports, when people are greeting where they, the, the loved ones are going or they're arriving, it, it cuts across all. There are certain things human in us um, that cut across all of our social um, and even personalities and all the other things that we, because those are personas, they're masks. They're actually, persona really literally means the same mask. Mm -hmm. But to get to the root behind the mask is to ask the question of the cultivation. And okay. cultivation only occurs um, really through this noticing and paying attention. And then actually, I'll take it a step further. This one client asked me, she said, this has been very powerful. Why is it powerful? And I said, well, can I let you the secret? But you can't tell anyone. <laughs> so I'll share it with you guys. When I'm asking these executives to notice other people, when they're asking them to pay attention with an open mind and not to criticize or compliment or, you know, have a script, what they're actually doing in that noticing, in that gemba, is that they are actually uh, conducting an act of love. That's what it is. Now you can, so ultimately, <laughs> between money and sex and power and religion, the other thing you can't talk about in business is love. But noticing is the basis of love. When you notice someone with an open mind, you are actually loving them. And when they're feeling heard, they feel loved. So, but I don't say that, I keep it as a secret because this is bleeding edge. <laughs> people are not used to this, right? They, and then we've got too many people just doing loving for the sake of loving. But, but that is the secret here around culture and cultivation. That's how societies and institutions get cultivated. Um, and by the way, I think I forgot to mention at the beginning the word cultivating. Think about agriculture. Agriculture is the cultivation of the soil. Or when we think about the culture of a yogurt, or the culture of a, uh, an experiment in, in, a, in a lab, those are living things. The culture of a yogurt is how alive is it? Uh, agriculture is the aliveness of the soil. So we've got to start thinking about organizational culture and institutional culture in the same way of what is the aliveness of this thing? As opposed to what we've been given is, oh, fill out the form, get the survey out, do the assessment, and then we have this lovely diagram that shows you what your culture is and where your strengths and weaknesses are. It actually, that actually gets in the way. And that's what's happened with these companies with this Me Too stuff we discovered. They were doing culture surveys. They were doing 360s. They were doing all these assessments. But all it was doing was masking the authentic conversation. They were having fake conversations. Okay, thank you so much. Any other questions in the audience? I prepared questions for you, Kashmir. Oh, okay. So I say, I, I want to make a test here. This is based, is the Proust questionnaire. Question number one, Kashmir, what is your idea of perfect happiness? Perfect happiness. Um, wow. Perfect happiness. There's such a thing. Um, I think it's holding my wife's hand. <laughs> Lovely. What is your greatest fear? She won't hold my hand. <laughs> no, no, that's a joke. My biggest fear, um, I, I think the biggest fear is the harm to my loved ones yeah the disease illness accidents um yeah that's mm -hmm. the biggest always the fear of particularly with children and elderly of them being yeah that's always a fear at the back mm -hmm. 
what is the trait you most deplore in yourself? <laughs> well, my trait, I just, um, I must deplore. <sighs> That's hard. Um, okay, you know, I, I think sometimes um, it's probably my greatest strength is also my greatest weakness is I seemed up thinking too much, <laughs> asking too many questions. I could have a much easier life. I just went, ah, here's the model. Keep, rinse and repeat, keep, rinse and repeat. So I think that's, I sometimes get annoyed with the fact that I go too <laughs> deep. <laughs> I like that. Then what is the tray you most deplore in others? Oh, oh, that's easy. It's, it's lack of compassion. When people have no concern of others, they're hurting themselves, they're hurting others, period. You know, lack of compassion or concern for others, I deplore. Mm -hmm. Which living person do you most admire? Oh. Probably my father, yeah. Mm -hmm. All the sacrifices he made coming to India, settling in England, raising children with really nothing, um, giving us a life, uh, supporting the family back home, yeah, be my father. Lovely. What is your greatest extravagance? <laughs> Ooh, um, cheesecake. <laughs> okay. And what is your current state of mind? Right now, actually, I'm feeling really good. This has been an interesting. Thank you for this opportunity. It's been great to. Um, but yeah, it's I, actually I'm, I am touch wood. I, I love what I do, and I'm very blessed with what I do. I always remind myself every day. Of, I teach my, uh, my, glad, my clients, I do coaching with them. I get them to do a gratitude journal. Every day, 15 minutes, they must write down what they're grateful for. And they hate doing it, but then they love doing it. So that to me is great gratitude for what I do. I love what I do. Lovely. Um, what do you consider the most overrated virtue? <laughs> oh, that's hard. The virtue. Um, I, well, that's hard. Um, I don't know, actually. The, it's really difficult. Um, okay, so I, so I think the virtue of is, is, um, is actually, it was one of the virtues, um, selflessness, like well, forgiving. Mm -hmm. Because so, sometimes when people are too forgiving, they don't draw boundaries, they destroy themselves. So some of the, yeah, so that one is a bit dangerous, I think. Because if you're too forgiving without boundaries and taking care of yourself, you end up becoming a, a martyr and destroying yourself. Lovely. On what occasion do you lie? <laughs> when do I lie? Uh, when do I lie? <laughs> What occasion? Uh, <laughs> what occasion do I lie? Um, when I'm coming home late uh, to my wife, <laughs> telling her uh, I was stuck in traffic when actually I was stuck in a meeting. She, she says, "Look, leave your business, come home." And I don't know. <laughs> okay. What do you most dislike about your appearance? My appearance. Oh, th this like. Yeah. Um, I think I could lose 20 pounds. <laughs> uh, you also? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which living person do you most despise? Oh, wow. Oh, that's hard. Um, I, well, actually, it's just easy in a way. Mr. Trump is a, a oh, total wow. idiot. Like, total cretin. Like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is the quality you most like in a man? In a man? Oh, that's easy. Um, his uh, anima, which is Carl Jung's version of the feminine in the man. Mm -hmm. oh, excellent. What is the quality you most like in a woman? Her animus, which is Carl Jung's, <laughs> which is <laughs> sorry, yeah, which is the the masculine spirit in a woman. Because mm -hmm. I think that's where the power comes. Yeah. Sure. Which word or phrases do you most overuse? Culture. <laughs> I, I'm just, I love all design and I've been pulled into culture all the time the last couple of years. So culture has become, I overuse that so much. 
So now the last one. What or who is the greatest love of your life? I'm just going to say family because that's very difficult between children and my wife and my, my siblings and my parents. Well, I'll just say family. Okay, lovely. Okay, how was this feeling about this first question? <laughs> oh, that's superb, actually. It's great questions. Yeah, very... Yes, I, I was... Mr. Proust is very intelligent. <laughs> yeah, so Proust, Master Proust, 19th century France. But this question was used by, in, in a French television show a long time mm. ago, doing a lot, lot of years for the audience. And I really liked the connections, the emotional connections you, you, you become from these questions. So I will just cover it. So I will try to use it here in that session, asking the same question to every speaker. Mm -hmm. So do you have any other questions, guys? If not, I thank you so much for your time. Kashmir, I'm very thankful. This was a very great talk, very inspiring. Thank you. Uh, I guess I will make this video available very, very quickly. There's nothing more to cut and to do something because I didn't talk that much. And, okay. and thank you so much and you're all welcome. So next talk will be, we'll have something I guess next week is Anna Roisman. She's a great, she's a world leader in, in testing. So more technical stuff and take a tour on the meetup and maybe I will send you a question to get your feedback because I will try to improve the format. Thank you so much. I will stop the, the recording by now.